Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Real Science Exchange, the podcast where leading scientists and industry professionals meet over a few drinks to discuss the latest ideas and trends in animal nutrition. Hi, I'm Scott Sorrell, one of your hosts here at the Real Science Exchange. And tonight we're excited to introduce a new segment into our podcast rotation, the Journal Club, styled after the traditional journal clubs convened at universities across the U.S. and around the world. We'll take a closer look at some of the newest research being published today. Once a month, we'll welcome back Dr. Bill Weiss, Emeritus Professor at The Ohio State University to the Exchange, where we'll discuss selected papers that were recently published in selected scientific journals. To gain additional insight and to spice up the discussions, we'll also invite the authors uh, to join in on the conversation whenever possible. Bill, welcome back to the exchange, and thank you for taking on this role as discussion leader for our new uh, Journal Club series. Thank you for having me back. And Bill, uh, first, tell us what you're drinking tonight, and then tell us uh, which papers we'll be discussing. Okay. Well, I, I recently moved to Cincinnati, Ohio, so I'm drinking a local beer called Garage Beer, and it tastes a whole lot better than it sounds. <laughs> And I can actually see the brewery from the back of my house. So nice. I'm dr drinking a very local beer here. Yeah, you may have to have a pipeline installed. <laughs> well, it's across the river. But no, okay. <laughs> very yeah, well. um, for, for the first one, I picked two papers, and they're actually very, very different. And I did that. So if one doesn't catch your fancy, the other one might. Uh, both are quite applied, which, again, I think for this audience is, is the best choice. Uh, the first paper uh, we're going to talk about was published uh, last year in Journal Dairy Science, and the title is basically, I'm condensing a little bit, but Effect of Rumen Protected Lysine and Histidine on Milk Production and Energy and Nitrogen Utilization in Diets with Hydrolyzed Feather Meal Fed to Jersey Cows, and that's from Paul Kononoff's lab in Nebraska. The second paper is, is also in JDS, and this was published earlier this year, so both are quite new. And it's the title of this paper is Effective Sealing Strategy on the Feeding Value of Corn Silage for Growing Heifers. And it's published by a group from the University of Moringa in Brazil. Excellent. Looking forward to hearing about these. Um, I see Paul Kononoff is also joining us. Paul's one of the authors... Um, for our first paper and also the editor-in-chief for the journal dairy science paul you just joined us on the real science lecture series of webinars but this is your first time to the exchange so welcome and uh can you tell us a bit about the journal of dairy science and your role as editor-in-chief yeah thank you scott uh it's a pleasure to be here um yeah as you mentioned i'm currently serving as the editor-in-chief and i have to tell you that's a great highlight of my career and it's really a, an honor to uh, represent the journal in that role uh as far as uh my responsibilities in that role it's really just to um oversee and uh and to be a liaison within the uh community of dairy scientists and i say that uh, very sincerely, I get a wonderful opportunity to interact with authors, reviewers, and editors from around the world on a daily basis. And I know uh, I have to tell you in the last uh, segment I was on uh, with you folks, it was just a tremendous opportunity to have international discussion uh, and and uh, engagement, and and that's exactly what the, the journal allows me to do. So in terms of uh, um, what I'm specifically involved with, obviously, uh, some routine editing and uh, review of each issue. In fact, today, the uh, next October issue of the Journal of Dairy Science arrived in my inbox, and I'll be reviewing. Uh, that's roughly a thousand pages. So over the next uh, ten days, I'll be I'll be looking at that. Uh, I get an opportunity to to work with editors as as they're handling papers, and then of course uh, also with with uh, with uh, authors. Um, we also recently had a podcast, uh, and those are available on the website, and they were just workshops on publishing in the Journal of Dairy Science. And I reviewed uh, what what's required in terms of uh, submissions 
uh, some of the the technical details around uh, submitting a manuscript and and just outlining what happens when it goes through the process. And that was a great opportunity just to interact with authors around the world. So yeah, that's kind of a thumbnail sketch of my activities with with the journal. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, can you give the audience an idea where they can find your uh, the podcast that you just mentioned? Yeah, we can uh, post that. But if if you actually go to the ADSA website, and then I believe it's on the Journal of Dairy Science website, you can find links to that. But I, I can supply that um, also when, when we're done here. All right. Thank you very well. Uh, we also have uh, Dr. Clay, Clay Zimmerman back at the pub table tonight. Uh, Clay, welcome back from vacation. And did you come across any new exotic drinks while on vacation? Ooh, that's a good question. I did not. But I'm, I'm enjoying my favorite <laughs> beverage on my Balchem thermos, though. Okay. So. And that favorite beverage might be what today? This is actually my favorite diet soda. Okay. I'm taking right. it easy today. <laughs> good. Not a bad idea. Scott, Scott, what are you what are you having today? So I've got something unique. Uh, it, it's called Forever Bourbon, and and so the backstory to that is I was at a Zach Brown concert a couple weeks ago, and my buddy was we were talking bourbon, and we talk a lot about bourbon, but he was telling me about Forever Bourbon, which is basically what you do is take an, uh, either a um, a decanter or a, an old uh, bourbon bottle, and you just kind of combine you know, the bottom portions of all your, your bourbons as, as you get them empty and it's, so it's constantly changing. And yeah, so it's, you know, kind of creating your own bourbon. So, uh, I'm going to get a, a, a decanter. My, right now I've got mine in an old Elijah Craig, uh, bottle, but I saw this really cool decanter. It looks like a globe and it's on a spindle and it. And, uh, so I'm, I'm looking at investing in, in that here pretty soon. So looking forward to that. Anyway, enough of that. Uh, let's dive into the first paper. Uh, Bill, give us some background on the first paper and how did you choose it? And perhaps a bigger question, what's the criteria you plan to use when selecting, uh, papers in the future? Okay. <clears throat> we'll start with the, the last point you raised. And again, the, this is these are applied papers. Uh, it's going to have to obviously have to do with dairy cattle, but not just not just lactating cows. I'm going to try and limit it to the last year. Uh, so it will be up to date. And some may even be JDS now offers. You can see papers actually before they're published. So really hot off the presses. Um, and again, I, I think of, of I want to pick things that are a little broader interest uh, to me, but also to, to hopefully the general audience here. And the paper today, the first one we're going to talk about, which is the amino acid and feather meal paper. I, I picked this one for a couple reasons. One is, you know, a lot of people don't know much about feather meal. And if you father, fo follow the um, Ohio State Dairy website, they publish, you know, feed prices every other month using the Sesame program. And over most of the year, feather meal is always what we call a bargain feed. You get more nutrients than a comparable, more nutrients at a lower cost than a comparable feed based on uh, MP, metabolizable protein, energy, and fiber. The most recent one, it was in the break-even category, but so it's always usually a reasonably priced feed. Um, another reason I picked this one, it has to do with jerseys, and it's not. I know jerseys are a small portion of the dairy population, but what are you know? Can we extrapolate Jersey data to Holstein and vice versa? So that's a thing we might discuss a little bit. Um, another big thing about this paper, which I liked, is. It, it's a paper about amino acids and bypass amino acids, bypass protein. And in this paper, Paul actually measured rumen undegradable protein in the feed stuff. And, and most of us, and I'm guilty as anybody, we just use book values, even though we're comparing this. So I think that's important. We should, we, I hope to talk a little bit about the value or the importance of really characterizing the, these, these feeds. And lastly, this has got a lot of data, which we won't have time to talk about, both on energy metabolism, really measured energy metabolism, not calculated, and nitrogen metabolism. So it's, it's tying a lot of things together with measured data rather than a lot of calculations. And I thought what we do is I'm going to give a very brief overview of treatments. Uh, we can't go into a lot of detail just because of time. 
And in this series, we are not going to go into a lot of technical details about the paper. We're not going to talk about statistical analysis and, and analytical procedures. I'm going to say, if I pick a paper, in, in my opinion, all that stuff is correct. So that we aren't going to discuss that. Um, in this paper, they had 12 Jersey cows at about three months in lactation. So around peak lactation, um, they fed a basal diet, which was 5% feather meal. So that was the feather meal was in, in all the, all the diets. It was about 17% protein. Um, I'm looking here in my notes, 56% forage, which was predominantly corn silage with some alfalfa hay, a little bit of soybean meal, then corn grain and soy hulls. They also, all diets were, were supplemented with RP methionine, which I think so we can eliminate methionine from this thing because all diets were supplemented with that. And they also provided about 100 grams of urea per day. And first thing I, I'd like Paul to get involved here, and you know, I, I've done a lot of research in my day and we've, we've evaluated products and feedstuffs. And I typically, if I'm evaluating blood meal, I'll go buy blood meal and, and evaluate it. If I'm buy, evaluating corn gluten, I go buy it and evaluate it. But Paul on this feather meal, he, he actually took multiple sources and fed these. So why did you do that, Paul? Yeah, <laughs> Very yeah good. Yeah, good question, Bill. Um, so actually, I mean, a little bit of background to, to this study, and I think that that may help us explain why we did some of that. But this study is actually a, a follow-up study. Oh, about a year and a half ago, we published a study just looking at the simple inclusion of feather meal. And we, we titrated it up from 0% up to roughly 10% of the diet, just replacing some common uh, feed bypass sources. And um, in that study, what we saw is that the, the perform, despite maybe feather meal being uh, kind of an unusual feed, uh, we actually saw pretty impressive uh, milk performance in the study. And it was, it was really quite striking to see how the cows, you know, they, they consume this stuff and uh, they milk well on it. Um, there was one exception to that is uh, what actually we saw was a reduction in milk protein. And so that kind of left us uh, scratching our head saying, well, you know, why did we see a reduction in milk protein? Um, and so obviously uh, there's been a little bit of work, especially out of uh, uh, Penn State, Alex Ristoff looking at amino acids. And so we decided to go back to kind of that base formulation and uh, and poke around on amino acids. And in this case, we identified histidine and lysine. But so uh, that, that's kind of the background. And then you think about our test product that we used here. You know, quite often, and um, you know, and, and I'm guilty of it, you know, feeding uh, some byproducts, quite often we'll select one byproduct from the industry and then uh, feed it in a lactation study. Well, the reality is that may or may not be indicative of what we're seeing in the real world. And it's and and if it's um, an addition to that is we often work with, you know, feed tables, uh, you know, default values in our nutrition models, which for the most part, we're working on uh, mean chemical composition. And so um, what we did is we, you know, got on the phone and uh, we uh, called several suppliers of feather meal and had it delivered. And uh, as you can imagine, that wasn't always easy. We were getting feather meal from like uh, Texas and uh, Maryland, you know, just different places in the world. I can't exactly remember these cases, but trying to get these uh, feeds in, it was uh, a little bit above and beyond. But I think one of the things that we got was uh, um, we were able to get these in, mix them, and then get something that's pretty indicative of the feed tables. Um, you know, average RUP of about 68% and the digestibility of that is 65%. That's pretty close to what's listed in the NRC. Um, the other thing, you know, I, I would mention is, uh, you know, feather meal can really vary like all byproducts in, in chemical composition. Bill, you and I published a paper uh, again, this is probably just in the last couple of years, 
looking at uh, variation in, in feed composition and trying to use a statistical model that, that you and Peter Yoder developed to generate feed tables. Um, I just looked at uh, feather meal in, in that, and it can really vary. Uh, mean dry matter content of feather meal is 93%. If you look at the 10th and 90th percentile, 96 to 99. But if you look at crude protein, mean crude protein of our paper for feather meal is 91, but the 10th and 90th percentile was 86 to 99. So big difference. Crude fat, that was a big one. 8.9% um, is a mean, 10th and 90th percentile, four and a half to 19 and a half. So we know that these byproducts vary, and it was a way for us to to kind of get an average uh, feather meal. So that's a long answer to your question, but uh, we thought it was important to to kind of look at kind of the the average of what's out there in our tests. Yeah, I think what's important here is a lot of people read a paper and say on feather meal, and they think that's going to be every feather meal in the world, and I can mm -hmm. extrapolate these results to the to anything. And we know that's not the case. So this one does mm -hmm. incre increase what we call the inference base. In a limit, one one issue with this, though, is if you have a really bad one and a really good one, those will cancel each other out. Yeah, Which right. to me, a very yeah. good first step to get a general thing. And then you might want to fine tune this to look mm -hmm. at, is there differences in, in mm -hmm. response to the specific uh, feather meal? But that blending, I hadn't seen that before. Mm -hmm. Paul, did the did the feather meals you used in this study did they contain much blood meal? Yeah, so that's a that's a good question. I mean, when you look at feather meal, it's it's my understanding that like all industries and um, have have developed and evolved over time, and as a result, the byproducts uh, have also evolved over time. One of the cases in the case of feather meal is uh, the blood can be removed and sold separately um and uh you actually have caught me on that one i can't remember the source of these ones if they contained uh blood in them we actually did a follow-up study where we looked at those that did contain some blood and those that didn't okay. um but you know as we're talking i'll, I'll maybe flip through here and, and answer that question but you're right that's an important important factor on blood meal and it can uh, greatly uh, change the amino acid profile. Um, Paul, you measured, again, using standard techniques, the RUP and mm -hmm. digestible RUP or digestibility mm -hmm. that RUP. What, what, what kind of digestibility number did you get? And how would that compare to, say, some other common high bypass feedstuffs? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, we use the, the mobile bag technique in this study, and uh, I think we reported an, an RUP of 68, and then the digestibility of that bypass protein at 65%. Um, I, I will just say, you know, that also varies uh, across sources of blood meal in that follow-up study that I talked about. We actually measured... Uh, 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 a difference in digestibility of RUP as low as 53 and then as high as 73. Um, as far as other bypass uh, protein sources, um, I think it's important to say that maybe the digestibility of this RUP generally ranks on the lower part of the scale. And that's a, you know, that's probably a, uh, is, is one of the common criticisms that you hear in the industry is that the digestibility of feather meal is low. And so we were, uh, as if we were seeing this at about 65, it's not, it's not, um, it wouldn't be a surprise or to expect other uh, byproducts such as uh, distillers grains or blood meal to be greater than 85%. So yeah, we're about 20% 20, 20 lower than a lot of common bypass sources. Uh, that's an important thing maybe to set up as we talk about this. And I think, you know, when you're looking at feedstuffs, you, you need, when you're pricing these things, and, and Sesame does this, it prices it based mm -hmm. on digestible RUP. I don't know what number they use, but mm -hmm. if you were just to price this on RUP, it would be 
overpriced compared to some of these much more digestible yeah. ones. It doesn't mean you can't feed it. It just means you have yeah. to pay for pay, pay an appropriate mm -hmm. price. Mm -hmm. And again, mm -hmm. I think the market realizes this and it's usually mm -hmm. that's one reason it's it's cheaper on an RUP yeah. basis. Yeah, right. Um, let's just get into the meat of this now. And and I'll let you kind of just real at a broad brush. The pr we'll, we'll concentrate on production responses. So what what were the kind of the big picture production responses, these, these four treatments? And I don't mm -hmm. actually, I think I got off the base here and don't, forgot the treatments. We had the oh, basil yeah. with every, yeah. all the diets at 5% feather and 17% crew protein. Mm -hmm. uh, the control had nothing added. You had a treatment where you added RP lysine. Um, and I have the note here, I think it's 70 grams or something around that. Another treatment with uh, RP histidine, which I think I, I again I'd have to scroll up at 15 or 20 grams of RP histidine, something like that. 32. 32. I only missed by that much. <laughs> you, you were close. <laughs> only 50% <laughs> off. <laughs> and then the fourth diet had had the 70 grams of RP lysine and the 32 grams of RP histidine. The only technical aspect or research, technical research aspect is this was a Latin square which to remind people that's where a cow will be fed one of the diets for a period. Your periods were four weeks. They switched to another diet for four weeks, another diet and another diet. So mm -hmm. every cow is fed every diet over during the duration of the experiment. So again, with the standard, just standard production, what kind of did you, do you see from these four treatments, Paul? Yeah. So, um, Again, the kind of base or control is basically a little bit of histidine and none of these uh, rumen protected amino acids. When we looked at the rumen protected amino acids individually and the effects, uh, what we what we didn't see is any positive responses by supplementing uh, rumen protected lysine. So we never saw any responses in, in milk yield uh, or Honestly, we kind of expected maybe uh, we'd see a positive response in milk protein. Keep in mind, in the the first study that we did, we saw a reduction in milk protein. So we thought maybe if we add a little bit of uh, lysine, we'll get a bounce. Maybe those diets were low in lysine. In this study, we did not observe that. However, what we did see in in this study is when we did add rumen protected uh, histidine. Uh, milk production did go up. Uh, and so I think uh, there'll be a link for uh, the listeners for for this manuscript, but um, that's found in table six. And so uh, what we did see is roughly um, um, in, in the one case is as much as a kilogram increase in milk yield. Uh, the percent milk protein didn't change with histidine, but with that added volume of milk, we saw um, uh, a trend for uh, increased milk protein uh, yield as well. Paul, the other thing that that was maybe different about this study compared to a lot of the the other histidine studies, the diet was not MP deficient, correct? Yeah, yeah, that's right. We um, uh, listed in the the table four actually. You know, we used the the dairy NRC two thousand and one, and um, Across the board, all diets were positive in what's expected to be MP requirement, roughly about 100, 100 to 130 grams in excess. It's about 5%. So it's, you know, it's a pretty good safety margin there. Yeah, yeah. The model's yeah. right. <laughs> and on, on lysine, you were also, again, using NRC and... I think it was Schwab's recommendation or about even the, the control diets or the diets without RP lysine were about right. They weren't that far off. So do you think that's yeah. why you didn't get see much or? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, obviously, you know, I think sometimes when there, there's some wild studies out there, myself included, where you really drive down a particular amino acid and then uh, add another one, whether it's through formulation or, or rumen protected. And you, you may sometimes see a bounce. In our case, with the, with the case of, of lysine, again, that's listed in table four, based on Schwab's recommendations, um, we were only about two to four grams short uh, on, on lysine. 
and then uh, for histidine about the same as well. So yeah, it's it's possible. You know, we are right on the cusp of 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 the requirements, and that that's possible. Why we maybe didn't see the response that we'd be looking for. Good you point. Think, uh, kind of broaden this discussion a little bit. You, know, you use jerseys almost yeah. all the data from Schwab and everybody. It's Holstein. Does this mean or lend support that we can extrapolate Holstein data to jerseys with respect yeah. to amino acids? That's too broad of a based yeah. on the study. Well, I think we should all, to answer that question, we should all take a swig of what's in our mug <laughs> and maybe uh, <laughs> kick back from our desk <laughs> and get a little more philosophical. I, I'd uh, really like to hear everybody's opinion, but I see Scott's leading us. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> We commonly do, because we do do most of our research on um, Jersey. So we commonly get the question, you know, are our results transposable to Holstein's? We've done a little bit of research with both. And I'm always surprised whenever you go through on the energy side, whenever you go through the calculations and express everything as per unit of metabolic body weight, just how similar jerseys and Holsteins are. You know, they look obviously different. Milk production, milk composition looks different. But on an energy basis, when you when you distill things down to per unit of, of metabolic body weight, these critters are awfully similar. And I, you know, I have to probably tip my hats to the geneticists that that have brought things along kind of in lockstep together in these two breeds. So on the energy side, I'm pretty confident to say these two breeds are, are pretty similar. On the protein, we've probably done less work on that. Um, my guess is, um, my guess is, again, I think the recommendations are pretty transposable, but there's even less research out there on the on the protein side you know there's maybe some reasons i know people think that rumination activity is a little greater for for jerseys uh um and so perhaps there's some even differences in in fiber digestibility and some of that may carry through i'd be inclined to say we're pretty transposable but again you guys have had a chance to to take a sip what are your thoughts uh that's my opinion i don't know what what the thoughts are of this group i, I think on on the energy i agree with you know there's been studies where they've compared digestibility uh up through the methane there's i haven't seen anywhere they look at any uh, measured any but i think they're probably pretty similar at least for normal diets maybe extremes there they not and then on protein you start thinking why would they be different and you think okay maybe microbial protein synthesis but digestibility is pretty similar so i'm going to say probably not a lot different i don't think and i'm not sure about this but i i'm assuming the casein percent casein in the milk protein is probably similar between the two breeds i'm not sure on that someone can definitely correct me so again you start thinking well, I don't know why they would be different. I'm not ready to say they're not different, but I can't come up with a reason to say mm -hmm. there's significant differences. Yeah, I would agree with that as well. Is that a short answer? I know that, that is. That's a short answer. <laughs> Take another sip there. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Bill, he made it snappy. You're always telling me to make my writing snappy. Wait. He made it snappy. You shouldn't complain. Okay. <laughs> all right. I mean, we, we do get those questions all the time in the field, obviously. It's a, it's a great question. And, you know, jerseys are a growing portion of the dairy population. So it's in, and there is, there is a, a tremendous limitation on Jersey based data. So, okay. A um, few other things here. I want to get into this uh, energy just a little bit. One thing I found pretty interesting is lysine reduced methane production. A few people that have ever measured this with amino mm -hmm. acid supplementation. A lot of, some things just happen, just a fluke. We all know it can happen. 
Do you, do you think this is real? And if if it is, why? what's the mode of action, do you think? Well, again, I, I'd be happy to hear your opinions. I know when this happened, and you know, one thing I haven't mentioned is uh, uh, the first author on this paper is uh, Logan Morris. Uh, he's actually an OSU undergrad and then master's uh, student. And then he came here to work on a, on a PhD. I still remember the day Logan came into my office uh, to tell me about the results. And we wa went, went through a lot of this and a lot of it was expected. Uh, but then he told me about this methane thing. And he said, uh, adding rumen protected lysine reduced methane. And uh, I really scratched my head. And one of the things I did is I, I said, I don't have a good reason, but let's just work through the cowboy math on how much fat these animals would have been consuming in that product, which, which obviously the room protected uh, lysine uh, product had some fat on it. I thought, you know, just the crazy idea, maybe it had some effect on the rumen microorganisms that produce methane. And, you know, there's some research out there in the literature showing that, you know, as you do feed fat, methane production is reduced. And so, he went through the cowboy math, and I think, if I recall correctly, it was roughly 35 grams of added fat that those animals consumed. So I think in the paper, we suggested, well, although they did consume a little bit of fat, uh, that could reduce methane, but we didn't actually think that that would be enough to show these kind of differences. Yeah. So uh it's a, maybe a long way of me getting to the answer. We really don't know. It was kind of unexpected, and I'm not sure if that's a, a real effect. Um, I don't know. I, the fat would be the first thing I looked at, but there's no way 35 grams would do yeah. what you feel. Yeah. It's, a, it's an important, if it's real, that, that's a, yeah. energetically, that's an important, uh, ecologically or environmentally, it's important, but yeah. energetically, that's a, it's not just statistically significant, yeah. it's also economically important. I, I just did some rough calculations and your, your DE to ME to D, DE to ME efficiency was, was high. It was 88%. Mm -hmm. Average is, is 86. That's not very much difference, but with the intakes you had, that's yeah. the energy of, of a kilogram or two, 2.2 pounds of milk. So it's not a trivial mm -hmm. change. So it definitely mm -hmm. deserves some follow up. Mm -hmm. so I have no explanation. Is there any chance that some of the lysine escaped in the rumen? And then if so, is there any hypothesis that would lead you to believe that free lysine would have an impact on microbial populations or efficiencies or anything like that? I think you know, it's obvious some of it's going to be degraded. You know, nothing's 100%. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know my biochemistry enough to know if lysine would do something. It might mm -hmm. be toxic to certain bacteria, and, mm -hmm. and that's the reason it changed. So, Bill, are, are you're suggesting if, if we reduce methane, enteric methane production, we should see an increase in milk production? If it's enough. You know, everything is, is you got to calculate. And if they use that energy for milk. You know, yep. energy can be used for lots of things, but if you just, if, if you reduce methane and, and don't change anything else, there's more, that means there's going to be more net energy available to that cow. And again, it could go to milk. If it's in early lactation, chances are it'd be directed toward milk. Mid to late lactation, it'd be directed to body, body condition. But the energy, first law of thermodynamics says that energy has to go someplace. And a lot of times the difference is, is pretty small. So we probably could never measure it, even though it's there, but we just can't measure it. So, so Paul, I think what this is like a seven to 10% reduction in, in methane production. Yeah, roughly. So we we're on average uh, about 450 liters per day on the uh, zero lysine, and then it went to about, yeah, 410 liters per day. Okay, thanks. And, and then, yeah, as, as Bill mentioned, you know, the, the ripple effect is, uh, uh, and as Bill mentioned, you know, you see some efficiencies then that, that start to come up on the ratio of ME to DE. Yeah, just uh, looking at this paper that with lysine, your efficiencies were 88.5%. Without mm -hmm. lysine, 87.6%. That's not a big difference, but when mm -hmm. they're eating so much energy, it, it, it's multiplied by a big number. So um, I think we're kind of coming to the end. So what I'd like to end with here is one is 
And I'll ask the author this, put him on the spot is, you know, no, no experiment is perfect unless I conducted it. Um, so what, what would you change with this, this experiment? If you could, mm. could redo it and, and money was not a, an object, which it always is. Anyway. I like the, the question. So, um, one of the things that uh, we did observe, we haven't actually discussed it, but there is the rumen protected lysine actually uh, decreased three meth methyl histidine. And uh, one of the things that, that we wondered about is uh, if that's an indication of some of that lysine actually uh, going to the muscle. So maybe some of this lysine isn't being used for milk protein synthesis. As I mentioned, we didn't see it. Maybe that went to, um, maybe that went over to, you know, uh, basically holding that, that muscle there. And uh, Bill, I know you and I were talking recently about even like uh, retained nitrogen. So we actually saw the lysine resulted in a, in a reduction in 3-methylhistidine, and they retained a little more nitrogen. So maybe there's some benefit from lysine there. So, you know, my, my stopping there thinking, well, what could I do differently? You know, it would really be interesting to, to do a randomized complete block study. This was a, a, a crossover design. So animals were, were switching treatments every 28 days. It's really hard to get a good estimate or observation on, uh, on body stores. And so it would be really cool to feed more animals over a longer period of time, for instance, and in a randomized complete block looking at 12 week periods, maybe longer to see how body condition score could change. And then, you know, if you could develop, look at methods, looking at the, the uh, composition of that comp uh, of that, um, of, of those changes in body condition. So uh, fat and protein would be something I'd be really interested in, especially given some of these observations we saw. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, we, we often look at energy partitioning, um, milk to body, and, but we don't often do that with protein. You know, we, we, these aren't fresh cows, but fresh cows mobilize mm -hmm. a ton of protein. And we always thought, you know, by seven to eight weeks, they're they're done. They re replenish mm -hmm. stores, but we don't really know. So if this is happening, you know, that's long term. That has to be good for the cow. Give a credit to lysine if it, if this does happen. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then the, the last question on this paper is, what would be the next experiment you would do with with what you've learned with this one? What would be step two on this? If I mean, we actually did do a step two in this one and then that was published uh maybe step three but the step two study actually kyle mclean um and that paper recently come out it came out in the journal of dairy science you know one of the things we were interested in is uh is uh um i was mentioned earlier in the podcast that uh feather meal may or may not contain blood and so what we wanted to do is say well okay let's let's uh, look at the effects of histidine on feather meal with and without blood. And let's see if we can see, you know, a positive response. The assumption is the feather meal containing blood uh, would contain the most lysine. And then if we added histidine to that, then we should see kind of an added bounce both on lysine uh, and then the histidine. So that was our next study. And what we actually observed, I know you, you probably, you wanted to ask a question where I didn't have an answer, but I think I at least got an answer here. What we actually observed is like, there is a lot of variation in this blood meal. And what we observed is the feather meal without blood was actually more digestible. <laughs> and we actually saw more responses with the feather meal uh, without blood. And so uh, that I think, you know, goes back to some of the variation that we see in these byproducts and, and why they're important. And when we're formulating amino acids, you know, we're just trying to jiggle a few grams here or there. The reality is the digestibility of some of our base ingredients, especially byproducts, may vary a lot more than what we're trying to jiggle mm -hmm. with the amino acids. 
And so maybe it's unfair to me to say, well, we've already published the follow-up study, but but we did, and and we saw some really cool things uh, in that follow-up study that that I think uh, answer some of the questions that we saw in this one. Uh, that just brought up one question for me. Have you looked at the variation in the amino acid composition of feather? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I would say, unfortunately, we haven't. Um, we have done a little bit of work. Actually, uh, Cassidy Buse, one of my graduate students, has looked at the variation in digestibility of RUP. Uh, and then, of course, crude protein, you and I have done that work. That would be the next step is actually looking at how amino acid may vary. And certainly when you look at these products with and without blood, there's some big differences. Yeah, yeah. We haven't done it. Most of that is just due to the cost of amino acid analysis. And we've kind of uh, we've kind of just broken off uh, the points where, you know, fairly easy to measure uh, crude protein being one of them. Mm hmm. I you know, just thinking, you know, when we get down to these, but I'm, amino acids aren't quite micronutrients, but they're yeah. close. And with the mm -hmm. variation, when we're talking a few grams, the variation yeah. could go from very deficient to excess yeah. by a ton. And you yeah. never see that. So well, we're going to switch gears completely here on this next paper. It has nothing to do with amino acids, uh, but I, I picked it. This has to do with the effect of type of covering of corn silage and the one treatment was the standard plastic uh, often used, and then the other one was one of these oxygen barrier films. And um, they took uh, corn silage chopped at 39% uh, dry matter, so it's on the dry side, and it was alternate load. So the, the hybrid, the corn was chopped the same day, went into two different silos, identical silos. One was covered with the, the standard plastic and tires. The other one had this, uh, I'm just going to call it the, the barrier film over it. It went down the sides and then it was covered. You used gravel bags rather than tires. So there's a lot of, a lot of difference, but we're just going to say barrier system versus conventional. Um, and then they, they did the standard measurements for silage quality and that's been published previously. And, and so we're not going to go into a lot of that. But then they also fed this, which to my knowledge has not been done previously. Um, it was fed to heifers and they did this. I think one is, is probably that's an animal they had available, but they can also feed very, very high silage diets. The diets were 80 percent corn silage. Uh, the heifers were about five, uh, 570 pounds and they fed it for, uh, I believe, 60 days, two months. Um, and the stand, the results here, I'm just going to give a quick overview of the re results and we'll bring others into the discussion is again, it did what we expected at the oxygen barrier, higher lactic, lower pH, lower temperatures, um, uh, better stability. So all that's pretty much standard stuff. It's been shown to, to, to greatly improve fermentation, the, the barrier. <coughs> They measure dry matter loss and you do this by burying bags in the silage and then you take them out and, and weigh it and, and analyze it. And again, that's been done. Um, and and they reduced, losses were reduced, especially in the top, uh, I think they measured the top six inches and then the entire silage. They cut, cut losses, the top six inches in half from 8% down to four. Losses within the mass, deeper in the mass weren't, weren't different. So again, all this was pretty much expected. But then what they did was when they fed this, as they're feeding, they, they, they took out, I think, six or eight inches a day. So pretty good feed out rates. And they, before they fed it, they appraised, they said, okay, this silage, they called it inedible. It was moldy, rotten, hot, and the rest was what they call edible. And they weighed those two fractions, but then they blended it back together. So they fed what was called inedible. And the inedible silage was 4% of, of the silage with the standard covering, 4%. And with the barrier, it was less than 1%. So you know, if the, the dry matter losses weren't that much better with the barrier, but if you look at what the inedible or the edible stuff was, was a whole lot better. Um, but again, they fed fed this. They blended it back together in the same thing, and they fed it to these heifers. Then they um, 
what they found when they fed it is that the heifers fed the, the barrier silage eight, two pounds more dry matter a day, which, you know, is that's a very significant increase. And they grew at almost a third of a pound faster per day over this 60 day period. Um, feed efficiency was the same. I guess the, the bottom line question for the group here is, is with the better ADG and reduced silage losses, the, the barrier film is more expensive. There's no, no question on that. Is, is it worth it? Do you think mm -hmm. this, this would be enough to, to justify the cost? Or what so, would you consider with, when you're do, doing an economic analysis? What all, what all should be considered? Yeah, so, so how would that translate to lactating cow then? That, that's... It's a good question. What do you think? Yeah. Do you think so, it'd be greater effect or lesser effect? Those heifers that were fed the 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 oxygen barrier corn silage, so they they ate more meals per day, right? And they yep. and they're eat, but also their eating rate was faster, which was interesting. So I would think that would have a lot of implications, especially in uh, in transition cows or in overcrowding situations and, and you know the, the intake gain was 10 percent. they ate 10 percent more than the controls and just think mm -hmm. if we could increase the lactating cow by right intake by it, it probably wouldn't because we're not going to feed an 80 percent silage diet but you got half that mm -hmm. just think of what milk that would be and you know this was only four percent junk silage in this stuff compared to about one percent junk silage so just think just that little bit of, of stuff that should be scraped away and thrown away mm -hmm. had this this large of an effect it, to me that was extremely surprising i mean when you think about nutritionists in the field oh i don't know i don't know how many of them are taking when you talk about representative samples of what these animals are actually eating or are they digging to you know unspoiled feed what are they sending in but you know even if they were sending representative uh samples of what's in the forage mass i would say the things that they're measuring uh routinely for forage quality aren't the things that are indicative of forage quality in this study, which is in table one, looking at yeast, lactic acid, spores, even ammonia and, and the VFA. So these are differences that don't even show up on the forage tests. Um, the other thing that I find interesting is um, the the digestibility between these two forages were, were uh, uh, there was no difference in digestibility, maybe a little bit on crude protein, but that was maybe just a trend, but no differences really in digestibility. So this is a um, big part of this, I think, is just palatability, right? Behavior, you know, that intersection between nutrition and behavior. And uh, especially if you think about, uh, you know, picky animals, animals that were really sensitive, trying to get feed intake, as Clay mentioned, transition cows. Um, I, I definitely think, you know, going through the economics of it is, critically important um and so yeah looking at differences in expected dry matter intake uh and then you know some of these other things that maybe aren't here mycotoxins you know that's not something that we can measure but is there a cost to that yeah absolutely again harder to measure mm -hmm. so i i definitely think there's a case to be made to to evaluate the economics of this and i think in lactating cows um there could be some huge advantages mm -hmm. I just think from um, me going out once in a while, you know, a lot of a lot of producers will scrape away the junk, put in a pile, and and give the good silage to lactating cows. But then they turn around mm -hmm. and say, "Oh, these are just mm -hmm. heifers. That's right. Get rid yeah. of the scrap. Yeah. That's right." <laughs> and this yeah. just shows how sensitive again yeah. animals that don't need a lot, um, how how sensitive or how important this this or how detrimental this young stuff really mm -hmm. can be. And it, to me, just justifies even if you you don't want to use the the barrier film, it just it really justifies throwing away that crap. It's just mm. not the price, the little bit of feed dollars you're saving is is clearly not economical. So, it, Bill, it reminds me of a it was a paper. I don't know. It was pro probably published ten or twelve years ago out of Keith Bolson's oh, lab, yeah, yeah. where 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 they intentionally created spoilage yeah, yeah. and fed it to beef steers. Yeah. With dramatic results. Oh, it was huge. And I remember that study and I was going to look up the details. I know the highest level they fed was 
junk silage with the remainder of good silage. Um, and I think, but I think the lowest they went were like six or seven. So, and this is even lower, just showing how sensitive these animals are mm. to the stuff that we, we know we mm. shouldn't be feeding. Mm. He did this with beef animals several years ago. Gentlemen, remind me from an analytical perspective where the edible portions of both piles uh, deemed the same from a nutritional perspective? If I remember correctly, they didn't really analyze either, both of them. They analyzed the top uh, six inches, which probably made up the majority of the inedible and the rest. And on the standard nutrients, not the stuff Paul was talking about, but protein, fiber, et cetera, those were pretty similar. So it's yeah. it's got to be more than than the just, the, it's just, it is not clearly not just the standard nutrients. I think with the feeding behavior data, it is a palatability issue. Use that word a lot. And a lot of times we shouldn't use it. But in this case, just because they changed the way they eat, they did. They took a long time for them to eat it. So I think these heifer setters said, God, maybe something better will come along. <laughs> and I don't have to eat this stuff. But There was a difference in aerobic stability, too, which yeah. you would expect. Again, I think the, the film is it clearly made better silage. But even if you don't want to spend that money, throw away the junk. It's just not even to heifers and clearly dry cows. I think it would be a catastrophe but it's just not worth it. Yeah. Silage is not that valuable. Any Anything else on, on this, this paper? Or, no, I, I mean, I think like just broadly speaking, just shows you the value of, of good, making good quality forage. I mean, exactly. I've, I've been to feedlots where they don't even cover silage. There is an investment in getting it there and uh, you're not, you know, you're going to negatively affect feed intakes in a big way. And you can imagine if this stuff wasn't even covered, what the quality would look like. Yeah. And of course, Bill, the only, the, the spoilers are throwing away. It's only what they can see visually. Yeah, exactly, it's, exactly. It's spoiled below that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I know Keith's done, there has been people where they looked at silage, these silage quality measures at different inches from the top. And it, it goes down. Sometimes it's 18, 24 inches of still, inferior silage so um it, it can be go bad a long way and look okay well gentlemen i think that's going to take us to our last call uh and with that what i'd like to do is ask uh all three of you to come up with two key takeaways from today's discussion and i'll let clay kick it off well so yeah i think i think on the the first paper on the amino acid side um Certainly the, you know, the, the importance of amino acid supplementation in these early lactation cows, the, uh, the, the, the histidine findings are pretty interesting in this study. Um, of course, there is no commercially available RP histidine right now. Really, at, you know, at that point, you know, where do you turn it? it it'd, be, it'd be to a high quality blood product at that point, really, you know, as far as looking 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 at a histidine source there so that uh, that would be a takeaway to me it 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 actually amazes me if you look through the literature where we supplement histidine we we almost always see a positive response uh, production response with histidine so i i find that very interesting the silage barrier paper again just a really great example again as paul alluded to of you know putting up high quality forage and 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 how it could negatively affect uh performance uh if you if you don't take care to uh to preserve it properly okay so i'm yeah as as far as uh takeaway points on my side of things you know just you know in feed byproducts i think there's tremendous opportunities uh, to reduce feed costs uh, by feeding byproducts. But I do think, you know, when possible, I think that our studies demonstrate the importance of knowing chemical composition, especially when you're doing the, the fine tuning of amino acid balancing. So, um, you know, feed uh, byproducts have their value in, uh, in, in reducing feed costs, but it's still important to know feed composition. Uh, the other one, we didn't really talk about it, but I'll just say the dangers of using ratios. If you look at feed efficiencies in that silage paper, feed efficiency was the same and not statistically different. 
However, that doesn't mean that uh, there's no difference. There was tremendous differences in uh, in feed intake and average daily gain. And so I'd maybe say a takeaway is, you know, be wary of ratios and indexes uh, because uh, they may not be telling the whole story. All right. Thank you. Bill, any final words from you? Yeah, you know, I'll start with the last paper, and this is a bit more philosophical, and that is, you know, that was a very, very simple experiment, but it has tremendous application, and, and, and you know, experiments don't have to be real complicated still to help the industry a lot. The first paper, I think, emphasizes the importance of, of integrating energy and protein. There's too many amino acids papers. All they do is look at protein measures and there's too many energy type papers that all they look at is energy things and these things are, are tightly tightly interrelated and and i think especially i'm more interested in, in energy and i think protein and, and type of protein probably amino acids is going to have a huge effect or at least a, a significant effect on energy in these in these diets and that's something we've almost totally ignored and and so that methane thing Paul found, it may not be real, but there is data suggesting protein or showing protein clearly affects net energy values of diets. And so this, this is worth it, more and more research. Excellent. Well, gentlemen, this has been a lot of fun and I want to thank you for participating and helping us kick off uh, this uh, new journal club. Uh, really looking forward to having it as a, a new part of our uh, podcast offerings. And I look forward to the next one uh, when we get together here in about another month. I'd also like to thank our loyal listeners for stopping by once again to spend some time with us here at the Real Science Exchange. We're always looking to bring new insights into the science that is shaping our industry. If you have any ideas or topics or guests that you'd like to recommend, please reach out to us via email at anh.marketing at balchem.com. We're also looking to add a student audience to our next Journal Club podcast. If your student would like to uh, would be interested in participating, please send us uh, an email again at anh.marketing at balchem.com. And as always, please remember to drop us a five-star rating on your way out. And uh, remember, you can request a Real Science Exchange t-shirt. Uh, it's just, it's easy to do, just a few easy steps. Just like or subscribe to the Real Science Exchange on your popular uh, podcast platform and send us a screenshot along with your uh, address and t-shirt size to anh.marketing at balchem.com. Our Real Science uh, lecture series of webinars continues with the ruminant focused topics on the first Tuesday of every month. If you're listening to this podcast in early September 2021, then you won't want to miss the five-part webinar series reviewing the changes to the new 2021 Dairy NRC. If you're listening after September 2021, visit balchem.com slash real science to listen to all past webinars and to register for upcoming events. We hope to see you next time here at the Real Science Exchange, where it's always happy hour and you're always among friends. <laughs>